Divine Truth Book Group. These are discussions of books selected by Jesus and Mary. This book group discusses Through the Mists by Ephra and Robert James Lees. This is Chapter 21, Home. Hosts of this discussion are Mary and Jesus. The discussion was held on the 10th of June 2014 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Welcome everyone again today. We are up to our final chapter, chapter 21 of our discussion of Through the Mists. And we love talking about this book so much that we've broken this last discussion into two parts. That's not really true. (laughs) We've done it because there's so much to cover in this chapter. So I'm joined again by Jesus here with us. Mm. And Hello, everyone. How are you doing? (laughs) Let's get going on our discussion of the chapter, which is called Home. Yeah, wonderful chapter again. It is, yeah. Mm. All right. So there's many themes in this chapter Mm -hmm. that I thought about. Mm -hmm. But in this first half, really in the first couple of pages even... We see discussion about education, about progression, aspiration, God's way, Mm -hmm. service, the Mm. design of the spirit world. So there's a lot really in here, which is why we both felt we really needed to break it into two. Yes, yeah. It's far too much material to cover in one one session. If we start at the first, the very first paragraph, Mm -hmm. I thought it would be good to read it aloud and just discuss that. Sure. Every detail of this life is educational. When one has opportunities for retirement to meditate upon the knowledge he has gained, he is overcome by the mass of information which here naturally unfolds from a single episode, as also the unanim- unanimity, <laughs> unanimity <laughs> sorry, of Tespany. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll just read it again. <laughs> yeah. When one has opportunities for retirement to meditate upon the knowledge he has gained, he is un- overcome by the massive information which he naturally unfolds from a single episode, as also the unanimity of testimony to enforce the one great law by which this life is governed, even though the contributing agencies appear to have no possible connection with each other. Mm. So there he's really saying, well, he's entering this period of reflection, isn't he, Frederick? Yes, he is. And he's, he's thinking about everything that he's learned. And the first sentence, really, of the paragraph is so um, powerful, really, isn't it? That yeah. every part of the life in the spirit world that he's experienced has been educational. educational. Mind you, it's the same here on earth. It's just that the majority of us don't engage it in the same manner. Yep. So the whole, the whole life on earth is also engaged in such a way and designed in such a way as to be highly educational. But most of us are fairly resistive to education, actually. Mm-hmm. We like to not change. We like to stay stagnant. We like to have a, have a fixed view of everything that often is established by the environment's fi- fixed view of everything. So if our parents have a fixed view of everything, then we often become fixed in our views. Usually mm-hmm. it's slightly modified from our parents' view. But then because we don't like to change and we don't like the process of education, particularly the way God does it, there's a tendency for us to be resistive to further education. And so we start seeing the life here as if it's not educational and the only educations we get are the times we go to school or we go to university. Um, But that's not the case at all, as most of us would recognise when we look back over our lives. Yeah, and I thought a lot about um, how we encounter the world around us when we're a baby or a toddler Mm. in those early formative years. We often view life as very educational then, don't Mm -hmm. we? And everything is um, weighty with lessons and more things to explore and discover. And there's a deep excitement in the process of discovery at that point usually because we haven't been shut down by any external influences. And so we're always asking the question, why, why, yeah. why? Yeah. And, and not only asking it, but engaging life in a very proactive and positive manner. And even when we have setbacks, such as falling over when we're learning to walk, we just get straight back up again and off we go again. It's yeah. like we don't, we're not that uh, concerned about mistakes at, in a young, when we're young. Yeah. Whereas as we get older, it seems that due to, again, the environmental pressures that we have usually from our family, 
by the time we get a bit older, we, we start becoming scared of making mistakes mm -hmm. and we're afraid of what people will do to us when we make a mistake and so forth. And so we start then to ex exhibit these qualities of not really wanting to learn because we're afraid if we don't know the material or we don't get the material the way everybody else does, that there'll be somehow some humiliation involved. Yeah. And these are emotions that start kicking in that control our desire to have an education f from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Absolutely. And yet Frederick's journey through the mists and everything we've seen so far and heard from him so far, he's displayed the opposite thing really, hasn't he? Yes, he's he has. been almost like a child in a new environment, always yeah. asking why, why, mm. how, mm. why. <laughs> and yeah. because of that, he's, uh, well, he's learned a lot, hasn't well, he? Yeah, he's learned a lot since his arrival and as we'll learn in this uh, chapter, his, his, this, the entire book only covers a period of a few weeks. I know. And, and yet he's learnt so much in that few weeks of time. Yeah. And this is, we, we also have the capacity to learn very, very fast and rapidly yeah. here on earth in a few weeks if we chose to. But for the majority of us, we're very, very resistive, of course, to the process of learning by the time we've become an adult, that it takes us months or even years to learn what we could be learning just in a few weeks. Yeah, and that's an exciting thing to think about, I yeah, think, yeah. that, wow, if I engaged, and one of the points for reflection I have that I'll talk about later, is about what, what would it be like if we engaged our life with the understanding that every detail of it is educational? Mm. Mm. I think we'd have a completely different viewpoint of our life and also we'd engage completely different things every day. Yeah. We, we would be far less worried or concerned about new experiences and, in fact, we'd probably try to create new experiences yeah. rather than always doing the same thing every day, day in, day out, which obviously is what we've constructed in our fear mm -hmm. so because we don't want to change and we don't want to have new experiences in that place. And many of us say, oh, it's because we're working for a living or, oh, it's, you know, we give some excuses to the reason why that is the case. But most of the time the real excuse is that we're just afraid and we don't want to put ourselves out there in the world and go through these daily learning experiences. Yeah, mm. yeah, so true. Mm. Then I like in the in that paragraph also that Frederick um, he talks he talks about how in even a single episode there's so much that's demonstrated and displayed to him, mm. and then he talks about the fact that all of those single episodes all have an overarching kind of a lesson mm. um, that and even though they're seemingly unrelated, there's this one lesson that or or meaning that comes through, through mm. every single experience. You could say there's an overriding theme of whole groups of lessons. So obviously the biggest theme that he's learnt is that theme of love, God's love, going through every single lesson that he's ever learnt. But also there's other themes. There's themes of truth, themes about desire, themes mm -hmm. about having a longing for knowledge and and a longing for experiences and what that does and a f themes about aspiration. And I feel in this chapter, he basically concludes with summarising many of these themes, yes. if you like. So one of the themes that has been very present is this theme of education, that yes. everything is educational. Yes. And so while he's demonstrated all these little educational points all the way along in the book, now he's basically saying, well, this is a huge theme about life. You know, life mm -hmm. is designed to be educational yeah. it's, and if you can embrace the educational aspect of life you'll you'll progress very very rapidly but if you don't want to engage the education then progression will be very slow yeah yeah so that's one of the themes one of the themes of the entire book if you like but also one of the themes that he's learnt in this life in the life of in the spirit world that he didn't or wasn't aware of when he was on earth yeah mm. yeah and he says that there's a unanimity of testimony to enforce the one great law. Mm -hmm. And prior to this, he's referred to the one great law as love. Mm. And so he's saying it's, he's bringing that in right at the start of the chapter and he's going to talk more about that as he yes. goes on. Yeah, yeah, so that's obviously another theme yes. that's been going right the way through every one of his experiences. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So then he recalls, or he sort of takes us through, I suppose, recollection mm. of the different uh, people he's seen mm -hmm. and the different uh, 
it's really the characters that he's come to observe where they're living, isn't mm. it? Mm. So he talks about the very first, it might have even been in the very first or second chapter, about the mother that he sees attempting to go to a higher space in the spirit world and being sort of pushed or drawn back because her own condition couldn't support being there. Yeah, and couldn't cope with being there, actually. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so in other words, the condition of love inside of the mother was such that her uh, that the love of that new location that she was headed towards was too great for her to bear. Mm -hmm. And so she decided to withdraw voluntarily through her own desire, yeah. withdraw to a place where there was a condition of love that she was used to. Unfortunately, that was a very low condition of love. And yeah. so she was quite, you know, she was in a sad place and quite an unloving place and had yet to repent for things that she'd done to her own children. And as a result, she was left in this much darker condition, but it was a condition of love that was much better suited to her me. feelings and development at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. And so that's another lesson that goes through the entire book, isn't it? This, this aspect of condition, like yes. soul condition, the true condition of love that the soul is mirroring to the environment. And, and we will be attracted to the environment that best suits our condition. Yes, yeah. even that the, that the environment mirrors to us mm. what, either what we need or what, or what our condition is. Yes. So when he went to the home of rest, that was all about having a really tranquil place where people could rest. Mm -hmm. He references talking about Marie, who was also in a sort of a convalescent state, wasn't she? From her harvest of jealousy, as yes. it, it was, he called it. Yes, mm. yeah. And who else did he talk about here? He also talks about Kushner himself and Mahan Yin himself and the fact that he couldn't exist where they currently exist because yes. of his condition and that his condition, he, 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 there was a sort of, there was no more barrier to being there aside from his condition. Yeah. And, and he started to see that just as it applied to going into the darker places of the spirit world, so too it also applied to going into the brighter places that he um, couldn't get to himself without help. And I feel this is something that most people on earth ignore quite mm -hmm. a lot, is that quite often we, we uh, like cry about or, or, or bemoan, I suppose is the better word, because we don't often cry, <laughs> but we bemoan our current state of existence and our current welfare and our current um, you know, living way of living and our current circumstances in life and so forth, yeah. not understanding that our current circumstances in life are the best possible place for us to be because it matches our current condition in terms of condition of love. Definitely. And, and so these, uh, in different areas, of course. Yes. And, and this is a great thing to learn on earth as well. Yes. And then also on earth there's this other thing we ignore and that is that each of us have an impact upon other people's condition of mm -hmm. love and therefore their circumstances. So, so if I decide to rate the planet of different resources, then the people who um, uh, who, who are not got an even spread of those resources will have a a, a more desperate condition, mm -hmm. and that'll be partly because of my selfishness. Mm -hmm. And there's all these kind of relationships also that we need to see with, that that are in addition to what we could be learning from these spirit life examples. Yes, and something I've tried to do all the way through this book is to help people see that this is not just a story about an adventure mm. in the spirit world, that every, every chapter is laden with lessons that mm. can be applied right now today to our life on earth. Yeah. And that's, I feel, the benefit of these books that um, Frederick and Robert James Lee, well, Frederick dictated and Robert James Lees wrote down mm. is that it's really educating us in the one great law and how God operates. And sure, in the spirit world, sometimes we see that with more clarity. Yes. But if we understand those things and then apply them to our life here on earth, wow, we can create not only a different life for ourselves, mm -hmm cause our passing to be really a pleasant thing. Mm -hmm. But also I believe we have the potential to make the world a better place for everyone. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah of yeah. course, yeah. Okay, so just talking about then these, this limitation, I suppose, of love. Can we call it a limitation of love? That's a little bit uh, oxymoron, isn't it? Well, uh, um, I suppose you could say love has certain responsibilities associated mm -hmm. with it. And this is one thing that, 
I feel he's also learned as a general theme through the book. You can, he can see that every time love was the constraining, if you could call it a constraining force, it, has, it was the constraining force, though, on unloving behaviour. Of course, love will be a constraining force upon unloving behaviour. Mm -hmm. It will have some kind of effect upon unloving behaviour. It will either cause the person to move from unloving behaviour to loving behaviour or it will cause the person to oppose the movement. And, and this is something that he, he starts to see as well. The fact is that every single time love comes about, but it also has the, it, it, it creates, uh, probably not the word limiting is probably not the word, is it? But it, but it is a, it, it's more about the law of love. And, mm -hmm. and this is where I, how I think of it probably is more about the law. Um, love is a law unto itself. And what I mean by that is that it then, it, it, it has a framework associated with it and, and things must conform to that framework, just like any other law. Yeah. And everything in the spirit world has, has that framework associated with it, right from the deepest of the hells where there's a lot of pain and suffering as a result of the unrepentant state of the people who live there, right the way through to the beautiful experiences that all of the people who are one with God experience because they have been repentant and also desired that relationship with God. Yeah, mm. yeah. So I suppose I was getting to talk then about where this limitation, um, the law. Mm -hmm. So I feel he expresses it in a really beautiful way. He says, there was no external power present to prevent me reaching such abodes of rest. So he's looking upon the homes of Krishna and Mahanin and he's saying, I can feel there's nothing external stopping me, but mm. there's this condition inside of me. Correct, yeah. And the only reason was in myself my present nature was unadapted to the surroundings. Yes. So it's such a clever design, isn't it? It is. Like I just often marvel about God's designs, how clever they are, because what really what what it is is the interaction of the person's individual soul with the law itself yeah. causes them to not go where they cannot go, um, they, but they voluntarily don't go because there's no way they can survive there yeah. while they retain a certain condition within themselves. Yeah. And it's such a clever design. It means there has to be no sentries, no guards, no, exactly. you know, there's no people who are policemen of yeah. the entire system, but, but it all works perfectly and seamlessly. And God doesn't even police the entire system. Yeah. The law itself is what governs every single thing that occurs. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, it's magical and I never stop getting excited about yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he says also in this section that the way is open to him. He just needs to engage, just like all of us, we need to engage our will yes. to get there. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, then he moves on to... So there's all these kind of reflections happening for him, of isn't course. there, so all at once? Two paragraphs so far. In the first paragraph, the reflection was this underlying theme of education of life. Yes. And then the second par paragraph, this underlying theme of condition and the governance of condition yeah. and the, how the law of love governs where you live as a result of your condition, or in other words, as a result of your soul's interaction with the law. Yeah. So that's another underlying theme. And then he goes on to this third theme, doesn't he, of... Of, of how you receive help, yes. what kind of help you receive. And how he's been helped really, mm. isn't it? So mm. he's talking about the nature of those people who've helped him. Yeah. Uh, and he says it, that it was more than he could have anticipated. Mm. The tender sympathy and humility which, with which those higher, holier natures render assistance to the weaker all the devices, the resources they have at command and the readiness and the ostentation with which they are brought into requisition to stimulate and encourage one to put forth every endeavour to reach all possible developments and corresponding advantages. Mm. And I think so, I like the next paragraph even more. It says, their love takes upon a hold upon the soul like a mighty magnet yeah. and it feels wooed and lifted. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, like I just I just love that concept as well, which is the way that it's the way you you can actually help people in the end. A lot of people do ask us, how can I share divine truth with the world? Well, what, the way you do that is by you yourself becoming a, a reflection of love to a greater degree, and then they will feel wooed, exactly, <laughs> and lifted. 
to that place. You don't have to force it upon anybody then. Somebody, or people want to ask you questions. They just feel empowered to ask you questions yes. after that point. Yeah. And that's the, what I love is that he's just contrasted the limitation of his current condition mm. with how he's actually being encouraged and wooed to alter, to move forward with that condition. Yeah. And so that this law of love governs everything. That was in our first paragraph as well. Yeah. And this interacts with our condition, which creates certain limitations to where we go. But then there's this whole group of people there yeah. who are designed, who are, who's, who not even designed, it's their joy, it, he says, yeah. to help people who, are, who have passed, to, to inspire their aspirations, to, to help them see what's possible and to help them move forward. Yeah, I like the way he says that too. It's, a, yes. it's like they do it as if they're soliciting a favour, but all the exactly. advantages are theirs. I've got no favour to give them, you know, like there's <laughs> nothing I can give them, but yeah. they're doing it as if, I, if they're trying to earn my favour, but they're not. The, there's no addiction in it at exactly. all for them. They're just doing it because they, they receive a lot of joy and happiness that gets accrued to them through the helping of others. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's a, that is the way of love too, isn't it? You don't help others just because of what you're going to get out of it. Yeah. You, you help others because there's a huge amount of joy that comes from being able to assist the progress of others and see their joy in their experience. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he, I like the way he, he highlights they, they're acting like they're doing me a favour mm. and there's no guilt, there's no patronage, there's no attempt to kindle a feeling of indebtedness mm -hmm. from me, you know. Yeah. So I did think this is a demonstration of what real service looks like. And yeah. as you rightly said, love, when we do love, service comes naturally. Like yeah. real service to others is motivated by the love within us, isn't yes. it? Yeah. yeah. And this kind of service is not frequently known here on earth. No. A lot of times you see people attempting to serve others. It, 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 it's really quite forceful or judgmental sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like where, uh, And you particularly notice that. Yeah, you particularly notice that with a lot of help that you can receive from the Christians, mm -hmm. Christian faith sometimes. They... Rather than just helping, there, there's some you see. Usually, you see a great contrast with the types of help, even in within one faith. Yeah. There are whole groups of people who are helping because they have a pure desire just to help the situation, a pure desire to teach a lesson of love or whatever else, without any feelings of needing anything in return. And then there's a whole other group that basically well, I'm, we're going to help you, but we're only helping you if you believe what we believe and if you accept what we believe and you. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? There's, mm -hmm. a, there's only th those kind of feelings coming from them. And this is not the way of love. Yeah. This, is a, this is just basically abuse and demand. And, and it's interesting that many people are teaching about love while they're at the same time being abusive and demanding. Um, and then you see uh, all sorts of uh, places in the world that actually do help other people without that abuse and demand, yeah. whether they're religious or not. And, uh, and so you see a great contrast on earth even between the type of help that is beneficial and the type of help that is just giving, giving, giving to a never-ending problem and mm -hmm. then the type of help that is giving only because of what it might receive. Yeah. Uh, and you see all of these contrasts on earth quite easily. Yeah, it's something that I, I agreed so poorly understood even the concept of what it really means to mm. serve, which is why I highlighted that. Yeah. Um, that this is a demonstration of what service is like for the person who's serving. Yes. Yeah. And and many of us don't have that feeling when we're doing things or giving no, things. And no. it's something to reflect on. And again, that's yeah. in our reflection questions. Yeah, well. and, and also for a lot of these people who are helping, they were they wouldn't be disappointed if the person didn't respond. Yes. Like they would just go on and help somebody else. You know, yes. they, they, they don't feel a feeling of disappointment or sorrow or anger about somebody's lack of response to their service. Yeah. And this is an indication too when there's addiction involved in service, you know, and you see this a lot on earth too where somebody gives to you, but they're only given to you as long as you do something and as soon as you stop doing it, then they're angry and upset and yeah. they want the thing that they gave you back and all of that kind of stuff and that's an in indication that it wasn't a gift in the first place. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, very true. Mm. I like the way that he um, phrases it. He says, there is, was only one motive, one reason. 
love that great master impulse which sways its unchallenged scepter throughout the whole domain mm. of immortality. Mm. It's quite a grand way of saying it, isn't it? Mm. It's yeah. like a great big sword that keeps everything under control yeah. <laughs> <laughs> without it being such, you know, yeah. without it being the sword that can harm you or anything. Yeah. 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 Mm. All right. So, again, we're only a page into the chapter, mm -hmm. but he brings up something else that's really... Um, quite important. Yes. So um, just there in the next paragraph, he begins to say, activity is the natural heritage of the soul. Mm. Excelsior, its motto and holiness, its goal. Mm. Thus their united endeavor had been to arouse, arouse in me a great desire to reach out after the ideals which lie, which ever lie on before, to realize the fact that the legitimate satisfaction of man can only be achieved when, like the psalmist of old, he awakes to the consciousness that he has attained to the likeness of God. Mm. Some pretty important things there, actually, particularly yes. this side of the activity of the soul. Like I, I see a lot of people on earth in particular in this state of what you would classify as blissful ignorance and blissful desire to remain inactive. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a very temporary bliss because nothing really comes of it. No real progress is ever made. And on top of that, uh, many of these people arrive in the spirit world in the hells because of their lack of desire. And they, they don't know anything about desire, in fact. Yeah. They, they neither know what it looks like to have a desire unfulfilled mm -hmm. or fulfilled, nor do they know what it looks like to have a desire in the wrong direction compared to the right direction or in a loving direction compared to an unloving direction. And, and because they don't understand desire at all, they, they sit in places of stagnation for such long periods of time and they are some of the most difficult people to help in the spirit world actually. Yeah. These people who sit in stagnation in, in a desire for ignorance and a desire for not doing anything and just sit there hoping that some external force will come to their aid and it never does mm -hmm. until they learn the lesson that desire activity is required on their part before any real change is going to occur. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very true. So activity is the natural heritage of the soul. So mm. it's our natural inheritance mm. that comes to us by getting a soul. <laughs> mm. We inherit this... Activity is part of our nature. Yeah. Well, it's and like before, you, just before you mentioned what it was like getting up to walk, you know, like, you know, the child getting up to walk. Like he doesn't sit on his backside and try to learn everything about walking. No. You know, he, he doesn't try to ask mummy and daddy if he could, you know, <laughs> mummy, how do I walk? And daddy, yeah. how do I walk? And, yeah. you know, all of those things. He, he's already engaged in action. Yes. And he's okay with that. The child is okay with that. Mm -hmm. And this is what we need to remain okay with engaging action where we don't know what the possible outcome is going to be. There is a risk that there might be some failure, uh, at least temporarily while we're in the stage of learning. Yeah. And, and we need to continue to engage that activity. If we don't engage the activity, we can't learn anything. If mm -hmm. the child just sat on its bottom and never decided to use its legs, in the end, its legs would atrophy and, and in the end, would, it would be bedridden for the rest of his existence, you know. Yeah. But, but the child doesn't naturally decide to do that. No. It doesn't naturally decide that with all these fears that I've got around me, of all these bad things that could go wrong, I'm going to decide to sit on my bottom and not learn how to walk. Yeah. And, and this is what we do as adults frequently. We, we sit on our backsides not deciding to take any activity in a certain direction that's going to be helpful. And then we expect there to be some outcome. Mm. And of course, there's not going to be an outcome. Well, the only outcome is, is that we develop a, a will that is atrophied. Correct. So we yeah. don't, then when we begin to, if we ever choose to decide to engage our will again, we mm. have to overcome all the level of wasting that's happened in this muscle, don't we? Correct. Yeah. And then we have to start getting up and we'll be wobbly on our legs because yes. we've been sitting around just sort of accepting the status quo in our life, mm. so afraid of learning and making mistakes, as you mentioned mm. earlier, that we just settle in a little, very small, confined space yes. and call that living life. Yeah. When really, if we understand 
again, the lesson at the start of the chapter, that every aspect of our life is designed to be educational. Mm. That means that as we learn more things, we change and grow. Yeah. And it affects everything, our external life as well as our internal life. So we can expect changes Yes. for as long as we're living. Yeah. And that's a long time if we <laughs> count living in the spirit world of as course, well. Yeah. And it's a lesson we have to learn either here or there. Uh, what I notice on earth is that there is this, you look at the average person on earth, when it comes to their education, their education is generally completed by the time they're 25 years of age, in their opinion. Mm -hmm. And while they might be learning more of life lessons, and most people acknowledge that they are, they generally stay in a job then for many, many years. So if they were you know, educated to become a lawyer or an accountant or a boiler maker or a plumber or whatever it is, then they stayed in that job for the rest of their life. And so this is an indication that education has stopped. And then there is also the same with relationships. Many people stay in relationships that are quite damaging and also do not grow and change for many, many years, sometimes all of their life. You, you meet people, couples who have had a terrible relationship and yet they've stayed in the relationship for 20, 30, 40, 50 years because they don't want to engage the process of change and learning. Mm -hmm. And and. The, the irony is if both sides of the couple engage such processes, they probably would still be together and have a stronger bond. Yeah. But, they, but unfortunately, because they want to stay in stagnation and not want to learn, not want to engage the, what it says here, the, the natural heritage of the soul, which is activity. Yeah. Or uh, the, if, if you say the next part, excelsior, its motto, which is getting higher, yeah, moving excelling. forward, excelling. excelling you know, so yeah. instead of settling for this is a fairly crap relationship, yeah. saying, no, we want it to we be want better. A good relationship, yeah. you know, instead yeah. of having this mediocre thing where one of us wants to go fishing half the time and the other one wants to spend time nattering with their friends over coffee, you know, yeah. rather than spending time together and things like that. And these kind of these kind of things, these kind of relationships, this kind of life, the kind of work like that, where nothing really changes is an indication that we haven't understood this lesson, that we're going to learn lots of things if we engage activity, mm -hmm. if we actually actively engage the process of learning in our life. So <laughs> let me put a question to you then. Um, certainly, a couple of generations ago, what you just described was very normal. Mm. People stayed married to the one person, whether they were miserable or, or uh, codependent, blissfully codependent, they stayed together mm. for the sake for the of the children, for, for the rest of their lives. Mm. And very often they stayed in the same job. Mm. Now, what we see now in modern Western society is that there is or certainly in our society, in Australia, there is a lot more change going on. Mm. Like people do get divorced more often. They have multiple sort of long-term partners, many people. Some mm. people don't even get married. They mm. just stay together for a period and then mm. that breaks off and they stay together with someone else for five or ten years. Mm. Uh, and the same with careers. A lot of people are changing. Like some people, I think the average is that, you know, a person can expect to have five different not just jobs, but different areas of almost career mm. exploration in their life now. Mm -hmm. Do you think that indicates a growth towards being more open to learning? Because I don't know if... Well, I feel it indicates that there is a more of a openness to God's laws in operation, mm -hmm. which is helping people realise that actually, no, they, ha they are able to change bad situations and they're able to work towards better situations. Yeah. But I also feel in some ways there is this underlying feeling now where people, they become dissatisfied with their current situation, but they don't understand that the dissatisfaction begins in their soul. Yeah. Like, so they don't understand the lesson we carried, uh, covered in the previous paragraphs, mm -hmm. which was that lesson that your condition, condition attracts yeah. things. And limits you. And limits and you, yes. And, and, and so most people want to change their in external environment rather than changing the condition of their soul, which will automatically attract a different external environment. Yeah. And I feel that many of us have not learned that lesson. So, yeah. so many of us have learned the lesson we, we don't have to put up with constant uh, lack of change in our life for the rest of our life. So we've learned that lesson, but we haven't learned the lesson of how that gets created. Mm. 
mm-hmm. which is all about the condition of our soul needing to change. Yeah. Once the condition of our soul needs to change, we're no longer just swapping a bad job for another bad job or a, or a bad relationship for another bad relationship. We finish up swapping a bad job for a good job, yeah. one that we really <laughs> love and enjoy. And we finish up swapping a bad relationship where both parties don't need, want to grow or one party doesn't want to grow into a relationship where both parties want to grow and both parties want to change. So that's an indication that there are soul changes actually occurring. If we're just swapping one bad thing for another and thinking it's good for a period of time and then it turns out just to be just as bad as the previous one, then we're not really making any conditional change in the soul. And, And we need to learn that it's all about the conditional change in the soul. That's what attracts these different things. Yeah, and I agree with you. And I feel that often there is... Because activity is not embraced in terms of the soul Mm. Um, and excelsior isn't embraced in terms of the soul, in terms of... How can I be the best I can be? How can I be the best I can be? In fact, if if you think about it, it's almost the opposite, isn't it? Most people go, oh, I am the way I am. You know, you can't change me. I've come to terms with it. I've come to terms with my nature of personality. I'm a type A, I'm a, whatever it is. (laughs) Whatever classification of what book you've read. Um, This is the kind of nature that I have. And and there's not this concept, actually, that no, even all of what you're thinking there can all be changed by you embracing activity and understanding that your condition can change. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's what I tend to see happening is that people almost have there's more of a willingness to change a relationship or an environment or a workplace. Mm. But it's almost as if when it gets a bit hard then then we go, oh, I'm not feeling good anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm not getting all my addictions met yeah. anymore. Yeah, <laughs> codependence isn't working for me anymore. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to switch, yeah. uh, which is not the true activity that no. Frederick is referring to here. No, not at all. And it's not really striving to be the best we can be. It's saying external things are bothering me. I'm going to change the external things, isn't yes. it? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and it, it, it is not honouring the fact that actually all of these external things got attracted by a condition that existed inside of your soul. Mm -hmm. And unless you change this condition, those attractions will continue. You can change the face or the body of a person you're with, but the reality is your relationship with with that new person is going to be very similar to the old person unless something changed in your soul. Yeah. And, And this is where we need to make the real change. And this is also where we need to engage the real activity. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 And then, I mean, to get the full power of this paragraph, Mm -hmm. Frederick actually goes on to say that the only time we feel fulfilled is really when holiness is our goal and we're we're striving for God and to be like God. Yeah. So that's a pretty big statement. That paragraph in itself, it says, activity is what we inherit. Mm -hmm. We inherit it. We get a soul and by getting a soul, we inherit activity and the necessity for activity. Yes. That excelsior, the striving for betterness, is the motto of the soul in its natural state. Yes. And holiness is its goal. And actually, unless we have those three things and are aiming for holiness or going towards God, we're completely unfulfilled anyway. Correct. And that's why I said in the first century that you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So under, once you start engaging your soul and your true feelings inside of your soul, you start to realise that actually all of us aspire to perfection mm-hmm. at some point. And, and that it's not a... Uh, most of us is given, have given up that aspiration because we believe it's not possible. But really what we're saying is that God is saying to you, yes, it is with my love. God's saying to us, with my love, with God's love, it is possible for you to become perfect and, and, and therefore reach this aspiration that's, that actually I've inbuilt within your soul anyway for you to enjoy and, and, and come to understand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like um, once we understand those three things, then we won't be sitting on our backside doing nothing. We'll always be engaging activity. We'll understand that our education is our, pri- our primary concern, but not our education in terms of ideas, concepts, you know, thoughts, but rather our soul-based education, which yeah. is all about feelings, desires, passions, longings, you know, learning, learning at that level. And, and then also engaging that actually all of this learning is about my bettering myself 
striving for excellence and becoming eventually becoming at one with God with, uh, in this process. And, and at one with God is only a, a point in the journey that will continue even after that because there's also after that at one with a soulmate and there's, there's mm -hmm. all sorts of things after that, many of which we've yet to even discover, humanity has yet to discover, which, which we can at least guess must be there yeah. because God's always created this beautiful life, if you like, that allows us to keep learning. And that's why I like there's a proverb in the Bible that says, that, the, the, that God placed eternity into our heart. Yeah. And then it says the reason why, so that none of us would ever find out what God has done. And, and this is the case, like God has created so many things that we can do, yeah. activity, um, to learn about God and, and that we need forever yeah. <laughs> in order to engage the process. And, and this is a wonderful way that God's created the entire universe and the human soul. Yeah, and I tell you what, that my journey with that um, that truth has been in the last five or six years, mm. because obviously I got very disconnected through growing up, coming back, growing up with some injuries, and I began to associate, or I did associate my worth with what I could achieve. Mm. So, and I don't think I'm the lone ranger there. Like mm. I think a lot, a of, people lot of people have that, yeah. that feeling. Um, and so when I remember having this discussion with my guides one day and they said, you love striving, you love always learning, you love never reaching the point of like, oh, it's all finished, mm. but you've lost that. You've mm. lost uh, that understanding, the love, the love of the learning, the mm. love of always seeking the new thing and never, never like going, right, tick the box, that's done, I'm finished, I'll mm. sit back. Mm. Um, and I think that's an injury that lots of us have to work through. Yes, of feeling like my own, my worth comes from what I achieve. And so if I can't say I know everything about God's truth or I'm completely whatever it is, perfect in, in one area, then I've got no worth. Mm -hmm. When really when we engage the way, we're continually being told our worth through receiving God's love, aren't we? Of course, we? yeah. And, it's and no love is longer... independent of the knowledge. Exactly. And, of the, and the, the sense of worth is independent to the learning. Mm. Like mm. the learning is a joy unto itself mm. and the sense of worth just comes from receiving God's feelings of our worth. Yeah, and I think the main reason why that's happened is that there is a lot of condescension on the earth with regard to learning, being yeah. a work in progress, as yeah. we call it. You know, we, we, we see a person who's learning as a person who's inexperienced and, and that's not true. You know, there are many people particularly in the spirit world, have huge amounts of knowledge at their fingertips, mm -hmm. huge amounts of experiences, and yet they still desire learning. And, so, and they don't look down upon learning. No. They don't have this viewpoint that a lot of, say, professors have to their college students who come along to their courses, yeah. which is, I know a lot and you don't yeah. type of attitude at all. They realise that everybody's at a stage in their life instead. Mm -hmm. and, and so because they honour the stage that a person is in their life, they, they don't feel uh, condescending or, 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 or belittling towards such mm -hmm. a person and they certainly wouldn't engage in humiliation of that person just because they don't know anything. Yeah. In fact, they have the attitude that yes. we just saw yes. in this paragraph above and that, and that is the attitude of why wouldn't I give you everything I know? Mm -hmm. you know I've had to it's learn it and I've had, somebody's given it to me. Why wouldn't I share what I know now with you? Yeah. And that's the attitude they would really have now if everyone had that attitude. Yeah. It would be a wonderful environment, even on earth, in order to learn. And I think you see that in good teachers, in select few good teachers, where they have such a joy at what they have learned that they're teaching and you hardly even realise you're being taught mm. um, because they're full of the joy of it and they just want to share the gift of what they, what they know. Yeah. And there's no sense of condescension that comes because all they want to do is inspire in you the excitement and joy yeah. of understanding that they have. Yeah. And that is really what, um, what Fred has described here with his, yeah. his helpers. Yeah. So, so could we say there's another theme? Yes. The other theme is <laughs> the soul must engage in activity. Yes. And, and if the activity is towards becoming holy, in other words, becoming perfect, perfected in love, mm -hmm. then of course the soul will receive huge amount, not only of rewards, but huge amount of satisfaction, satisfaction from, from sure. engaging that particular activity. Yeah. Mm. And so really, um, Frederick talks about how 
his friends have shown him all they've shown him mm. in order to help him understand that very lesson, mm. but also to engage his aspiration yes. to move forward. So, so that brings us to the next yes. under, underlying theme, doesn't it? It does. Mm. It does. Yeah. And let's talk about what that is. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to be rushing. I know sometimes you and I rush. No, it's fine. Uh, so, yeah, he's saying that that Mahanin prophesied that the sight would fire my aspirations. Yeah, so that was, if, if we think of that, that was in our previous chapter, chapter. where Mahanin said, look, if I take you to observe Omnir's home, you, you'll be so blown away by the home that you'll, you'll start to feel like you'd like to be there at some point in your future yes. is really the implication. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. And so Frederick says, yeah, it definitely did. I want to go there. But then he has this moment, doesn't he, which he describes beautifully where he said he sort of the question involuntarily suggested itself, shall I be contented then? Mm. Which again talks to what we were just speaking about, doesn't it, about enjoying the striving and mm -hmm. him feeling like, well, I'm going to get there and is that going to be enough or should I keep going? And, and will, I suppose he's also saying, will I ever get there as well? Yes, well, I feel in this paragraph now, he's really saying that a fear sort of crossed his mind. Yes. And this is what happens when you engage the process is that these fears come up quite naturally, right? And he started to feel the fear of it, the fear, the fear that... Well, what, what happens then with contentment? When do ever do I feel content? And then also there's this feeling of, as he said, the distance between the object of his desire and where he was right at this moment. Mm -hmm. And when he started to compare where he was right at this moment compared with like where Omra must be yeah. in terms of his you know, conception of where Omra must be, there's such a large gap between those two states. And so, so he's going, well, and then you're starting to feel a bit of the fear that comes up. Well, wow, it's a large gap between those two states. What's going to happen there, you know? And that's him allowing himself to feel some of this fear that he has that maybe he won't obtain or obtain, attain what he aspires to obtain. Yeah. And for a moment that thought crosses his mind yeah. that maybe he won't. But then, of course, my unconscious of it gave him another feeling yeah. um, to help him through that particular concept. To, through that concept. Mm. And just as a side note, what I found really interesting is that this is the first time in the book, in Frederick's journey so far, that he's aware of someone communicating with him, not with words. Yes. So yes. that's a progression for him in itself. Yes. And he probably Which he at the time didn't understand. Didn't yes. understand. And he doesn't yes. make a big deal of it. No. But it, I, I, it stood out to me. Yes. So Mahani conveys to him a different feeling, feeling which yes. Frederick calls a thought, but yes. it's really a, a Feeling. Yes, it is a feeling. Yeah. Yep. And this is about really the nature of the way. Yes. And this isn't this wonderful, this next section? Yes. Like, yes. This is, again, one of those the big thing. truths that the book contains about yeah. the universe and about God and about the way, the way in which God designed for us to progress. And just some really big truths in this next couple of paragraphs. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we probably need to go through them in a fair bit of detail, don't we? Yes. Okay. Mm. So... If I read this just by way of introduction, mm -hmm. this is the thought that came to him. There is but one way for all men to travel on their pilgrimage to God. The earth stages had been tampered with and rendered difficult to trace, but from where my feet were standing, the way was clear and unmistakable. It was the way called straight, whose engineer was God himself, and it bore his stamp and seal even as we find it upon the face of nature. Mm. So I suppose we could At, stop there for a moment. Yes. Because uh, there's a lot being said just there, I feel. Like, firstly, that the earth stages have been tampered with. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, God created, and what he's referring to when he calls it the way called straight, he's referring to a biblical quote, obviously, yes. both in, in, all, in most of the gospel accounts where I talked about the straight and narrow way that leads to life and then the broad and spacious way that leads off, the Bible says, to destruction. That's not what I actually said. But, but this narrow and straight way or, or, or the way that leads to life, God created. Mm -hmm. And we need to honour the fact, firstly, that God created it. No person, including myself, created it. 
we didn't invent it. God created it as a way. It mm -hmm. is the only way, in fact, for progression. And this is something that I see uh, a lot of people on earth get really confused a lot now because they believe there's many ways to God. But there's only one way to God, and that is the way God created there to be a way to God. Yeah. So, so God created this way. And all these so-called other ways to God don't lead to God at all, but they are all distractions from the main way, the, the narrow way that actually leads to God. Mm -hmm. And I feel that if we understood that alone, we would want to discover what that way is rather than focusing on holding on to our own concepts of what the way is or holding on to a biblical concept or, or a Koran concept or, you know, other religious concept of what that way is. Yeah. Or just believing that, oh, all of us have different concepts of what that way is and we're all right. You know, yeah. that's, that's a physical impossibility in God's universe for every different thing to be right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we need to give up all those things. So that's one way that the way has been distorted on earth. Mm. There's other ways, isn't there, in that... Um, Often people control the environment through fear and hatred and greed. Mm. And this distorts our understanding of what is rewarded in God's universe, doesn't yes. it? Yes, yes. Because of the free will of man used, or mankind, humankind, humankind. I should say, mm -hmm. um, exercised out of harmony with love, mm -hmm. on the earth specifically we begin to see the effects of that, the full effects of that. Yeah, well, we have a re another reality created. It's a distortion of God's reality, but we have it created because we all decided collectively that we would agree to this reality. Yeah. That is obviously very painful because the majority of the human race experiences a large degree of pain and suffering, both personally when it comes to disease of the body and things mm -hmm. like that, growing old, suffering, dying, uh, right the way through to collectively where we have whole masses of people dying before what we call their time and so yeah. forth. And, and people struggling with people poverty. People struggling with poverty. Crime, yeah. uh, women in half of the world, women are struggling still, you know, yes. with regard to in, you know, in how In their treated. basic, like the way they're treated in their families, in yeah, their society. in society and so forth. Yeah. And so all of these things are indicating we're in a lot of pain and suffering as a society and yet we still don't see that that's because we created our own ways. Yeah. And we're not, we're not honouring that. We're not honouring the fact that these are our creations. And I, oftentimes when I receive questions from people who say, why did God allow this? I'm going, well, why do you allow this? <laughs> like, why are you asking me why God allows this? God didn't create it. You created it and you're allowing it. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you can't really blame God for something that you not Most. only created or, or collectively created, but that you are also now allowing without any change, without any desire to change, and, and then we blame somebody else for it. Well, that's ludicrous to, yeah. to think that we can get away with such accusations. Um, of course we can't. And yeah. at some point we're going to have to see that all of these this pain and suffering that's created on the planet, which is what he describes there as the tampered with route, if you like, yeah. and all of, these, all of these tamperings that we've made because we've all chosen to do something unloving as a result of whatever is inside of ourselves, all of these tamperings are tamperings that we ourselves can undo. We can destroy them. We can get rid of them. They are our creations and God is saying to us, yeah, your creations, they're not mine. You need to deal with it. I don't have to because they're not my creations. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so this, this next part, he says, I find very um, powerful. Yeah, because he really talks about how, doesn't he? Like, yes. Like how the way is engaged in a practical sense. Yeah. And yeah. I like, so this is very much how the way is engaged, yeah. uh, described here in the next few paragraphs. Yeah. Mm. He says, at this point, nature became to me the interpreter of grace. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I want a wall hanging of that, <laughs> of that sentence because yeah. um, really he begins to describe how in nature there's gradual changes. Yeah. And that's how he then can see God's grace in the progression of the soul. Yeah. In that it's it's gradual. We make progressions. Yep. Uh, there's no clear cut point of 
you've done it now. It's, it's, we're moving always through a process. And there's a lot of grace in that. There's a lot of God's love in yeah. that process. I like the way he says that in nature there are no leaps and bounds, no cul-de-sacs or chasms or sharp divisions in its great law of progress. The order is unfoldment from within, stimulated by appropriation, appropriation of congenial nourishment from without. Yes. So you get this progress from within that has to occur, yes. which is all about the condition of the soul, yeah. coming by and stimulated by what's happening externally to you. And, 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 therefore, and drawn to you by your own soul, in fact. Yeah. Mm. And if you see that in nature, it's like the seed. From within it is the yep. process where it's going to sprout, but it has to have the congenial surroundings, surroundings around it. environment. Yep. Yeah. And like he says, who can say when conscious unconsciousness unfolds into consciousness? Mm -hmm. Like when does the instinct of the bay give birth to intelligence? It's a very slow thing that you don't even really notice happening. It's not like in that one moment, like when a child walks, there's a moment where they stood up and walked. But before then, there's a whole lot of things they have to learn. They crawled before then, they, they learned to stand, then they learned to stand unsupported and so yeah. forth, and then they start to walk. And, and each thing go, it leads to the next thing. Yeah. And this is one, one thing I feel a lot of people don't understand about their desire and will either, that if you just take an action that's in harmony with love in a certain direction on the way, you know, yeah. then nature will bring, yes. the way God's created it is, is, is that it, God's creations will naturally bring to you through the process the next step you need to take. Yes. The next step in the order of your your own progression. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess that's something that can give us all a lot of faith, can't it? Yeah. As long as we yeah. keep, it's not letting ourselves off the hook, going, "Oh well, I'm trying and not doing anything," but to to stay steadfast on the principles, the basic principles of humility, honouring truth, desiring yeah. love. Um, but also, we need to understand this all needs to be engaged. In the soul. Yes. And, and this is where I feel most people come unstuck with this principle. They, they think, oh, well, all I need to do now is act. I need to just take another action, take another action, take another action. No, what you need to do is take some action to remove from your soul, because that's the lesson that's all the way through of condition. Yes. We need to take an action that actually will in, in, improve the condition of the soul itself. Once we improve the condition of the soul itself, now nature will take its course. We'll, we'll be, it will draw to us another event which will also help us to improve our condition even further and so forth and so forth until perfection is attained. Yes. Whereas most people don't look at it like that. They look at it, oh, what I need to do is just take an action. So I'm not in a happy relationship, get rid of the person I'm with, you know. <laughs> you know, they get rid of them. I'll go and get another person who's better. So you go and get another person who's better. And, and if you don't change, then your relationship in 10 years' time looks identical to the one you just left. Yes. And, and this is because we're engaging action but not at the soul level. Yes. And, and this is where I feel we also need to understand his words correctly. We need to see that this is action within the soul. And as he said, and he, and he states it quite clearly here, he says, where he says that it's, you know, the unfoldment from within mm -hmm. stimulated by the, the uh, appropriation nourish of nourish yes. nourishment from without. without. So, so he's, he's always alluding to this underlying fact, and that is change has to occur within and you need to be willing to make that change. Absolutely. Otherwise, any changes you make outside of yourself won't be real changes, yeah. in fact. And this is where sincerity, it's such a personal thing. You can't, uh, no one, none, we can give you these reflection questions and all of those things, mm. but no one can sort of put into you sincerity or teach mm. you a device or a technique in order to gain sincerity. Mm. It must be a heartfelt, willful thing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I like how, and remember, these are all thoughts coming from Mahani. from Mahani yeah. into Ephra. So, so these are not uh, things that he thought of himself. They are thoughts that other, another person seeded within him yep. in order to help him overcome this underlying feeling that he had that it was a long way away from 
the goal that he was aspiring to. Yeah. 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 Uh, so he he receives that kind of analogy with the nature and, and the gradual um, changes. And he says, the thought consoled me, gave me strength and peace. Mm. The distance between me and my ideal was no doubt great, but it would be reached by a natural process of which the duration, to a great extent, lay in my own hands. Mm. And I suppose that's really reinforcing what we said about the sincerity and the, the internal will that you were referring to. Yes. And then, of the course, next... he makes a lot of biblical quotes to support his, <laughs> his argument. <laughs> well, and actually, I feel he almost introduce, introduces another um, layer or element to this mm. where he says, which is a direct Bible for, a quote, God is no respecter of persons. There is no royal road or cross-country cut to the throne reserved for an elect few. Mm. So there he's saying God doesn't play favourites. There's no place for all the, you know, special people to go. There's just one way for everyone to walk and there's no shortcuts either. Mm -hmm. And it's not just for a few, it's for whoever wants to go along mm. that road. Mm. Um, Yep, and he who makes the attempt to climb by any other will be cast out as a thief and a robber. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, these are all quotations, obviously, of things yes. I, that I indicated in the first century. Yeah. And, and I did indicate these things, that, that the, way God's, the way God had created for us to progress, you, you, you will not be able to manoeuvre around it like yeah. many of us are used to manoeuvring around the law of the land. Well, you know. isn't it like in a lot of relationships, even like father-daughter relationships or partner relationships, we figure out how to manoeuvre around that person. Oh, I'll just tell Dad this or yeah. just I'll just uh, stroke their ego the this way age, and then I'll get what I want. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, many of us then come to think of God as the same thing, like that we can somehow manoeuvre around all of God's laws. And, you know, if, if my dad was a pretty hard guy and I could manoeuvre around him, then God's a much easier guy and I say I should be able to manoeuvre my way around him pretty easily. And it's completely the opposite to that, of course. God's not a harsh person, but God has drawn the line in the sand with all, and that's what law is. That's what yeah. God's law is. And and what, what, what he's basically saying here is that we need to come to understand actually that there is the one way, there is only the one way to get to God and that is the law that God has stated is the only way to get to God yeah. and there is no other way available to you yeah. and you can try, you can try to be, you know, get there without using the way or the key that God has given you and, and all you are is a thief and a robber but you won't be able to thief anything or rob anything because... <laughs> Even that's not possible yep. <laughs> on the way. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, it's just like I just feel that if most people on earth understood that, then there'd be far less focus on their individual religious pursuits and their individual scientific pursuits and we'd start to see everything much more collectively as there is this way determined by nature actually mm -hmm. that and nature being of God's creation means that it's determined by God and God's laws as to how we need to grow. And if we refuse to grow in the way that God has designed, then we won't grow. Yeah. It's as simple as that. We might have different experiences. We might shift from side to side. It's like moving from one relationship to another relationship that's identical is just a side to side shift. It's not a real prog progression yeah. of the soul, nor is it a progression of your enjoyment or your happiness or any other state that you might enjoy in your soul. Mm -hmm. And we need to start seeing it like that as well. Yeah. And we, know, we need to start seeing that many of us are just going from experience to experience to experience and really repeating the same experiences over and over and over again because we're refusing true development of the soul. Yes. We're refusing God's way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Here again, he brings in the the issue of condition, I suppose, doesn't mm, he? Yeah. He says, not only is there just one way, but your progression is gradual and you're not going to be able to jump, as I know has often historically been seen in the... Well, in Islam and in Christianity, that salvation relies on just 
one set one of thing. words or one one shift in your heart. Mm. Uh, and he's and Frederick says, which is coming from my Hanine, you know, you, salvation is not a sudden transition from debauchery to mm. the white robe throng. So mm. it's not from living this life full of sin to suddenly your harps and angels sort of mm. scenario. It's going to be gradual. Yeah. And uh, in sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking that. There is this, even even these concepts appear in New Age yes, theosophy as that's well. Very like, true. if you if you look at uh, you know the different theological things we see in religion, you see this concept of you know one thing that causes your salvation, but we also see it in a whole lot of New Age type of movement things as well, where they feel that you can have one transition and all of a sudden you go from being the, you know, the person who knows nothing about anything to a person that knows everything about everything. Mm. And these kind of transitions encourage spirit over cloakings as well, yes. rather than actually a real person having a soul-based change. And, and this is very sad because what you see happening is these people who make these instant transitions in the belief that such a transition is possible are actually just being overcloaked by somebody else who, who has gone through a gradual transition. And unfortunately, when they come face to face with that fact, they'll still have to go through their gradual transition. Yeah. And such a, such a waste of time thinking that you're going to be able to make some kind of instant transition mm -hmm. from, becoming, from being a, a sinner, like, like you said, or like he says, someone in debauchery to someone who's holy. Yeah. And this whole concept of a instant transition is is dangerous to humanity's yes. uh, desire for for progress because it basically teaches that there's some mystical method of gaining an instant transition, mm -hmm. and once you've gained this or obtained this instant method, you don't need to worry about anything else, and everything else will be automatic. And that's not the way it is at all, and will never and can never be. Yep. And so these are some of the false beliefs that have become like a pandemic or an epidemic in each yes. religious faith. The, 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 you know, many of these faiths now teach these particular things as reality, but they're not possible yeah. and they can never be possible. And deathbed confessions are never going to work, as he said many times in the book. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, sadly, it is very much promoted on earth. Just or even, even in our lifestyle, just do this set of exercises for this amount of time and you'll suddenly have a perfect... Like, we all want the, the quick change, don't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. And, and this is an addiction that we have. Yeah. But also, it's a, it's a complete lack of understanding of the reality of God's universe. Everything is in gradual change, so mm -hmm. why wouldn't we be? Yeah. Like... It makes no sense for us to go, well, the whole universe that I observe is in gradual change. The environment around me is in gradual change. You know, my, my very home is gradually decaying or gradually improving depending on whether I work on it or not. Yeah. And, and yet I can have some kind of instant transformation that I never need to worry about again. You know, it makes no sense whatsoever logically. And yet we often engage these totally illogical concepts because of our underlying lack of desire to learn and grow. Yeah. Our lack of desire to go through a sincere process, our, our desire to have somebody other, some other magical thing happen to us so that we don't have to go through a sincere process that we ourselves generate. Yes. So this is where I feel many of us have become unstuck when it comes to our spiritual development. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Or even our development in any, in any way. form, in any way rather than yes. just spiritual. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really sad because, as he says, it's, it's something that is a, a natural part of our soul to, to enjoy learning. Yeah. But it's often through those early childhood experiences where at school or at home we feel humiliated or punished by not knowing or not being able to do things yeah. that we then, they, we then lose that joy, don't we? Yeah. 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 Okay. Now, so that's probably where we would like about, to stop, isn't it? I just wondered, there's a, he does wax lyrical a little bit with the biblical references. And why wouldn't you? Yeah. They're good references, they even are. if I do say so myself. They are. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, you know, I feel him get on a roll. It's, it's all so emotive and it's beautiful because course, it does yeah. stir. And sometimes I feel he's, he's attempting to stir within us what's been stirred with him, yeah. within him through that experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
And he's and he's, he's attempting also, isn't he, to bring together a whole heap of material that has been presented on Earth before. Yes. And and trying to put it into a totally different context than what the orthodox religious belief systems have created. And and it's very important that we start to break away from these concepts that we've created for millennia Mm -hmm. uh, because they have not caused any change and we start to see the real truths that are there contained still within the in the so-called scriptures Mm -hmm. both the Koran and other holy books like the bible and other books all all of them contain some truths with regard to all of these principles but we 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 we're not thinking them from the point of view of nature or from a very scientific point of view we're trying to present a religious theology and, and then call that god's way and God, you know, God's way is not a mankind created religious theology. No. It is a way that God created and it's all present all around us because it's a part of the natural scheme of things. Yeah. 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 And as long as we understand, start understanding that, we'll never go back to looking for one book which would contain all of our information or all of the potential truths that we could ever imagine us discovering. Mm. 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 Kind of exciting, really, to think that there's not just is. one book. There's a, there's a whole library of life out there, and and also that each one of us will become like a book in ourselves because yeah. by going through the personal experience. Once we go through the personal experience, then our life becomes like a word. Yes, a, a word that then it can be demonstrated through our actions to other people. Yep. You know, if you're really progressing on the way. It will become very obvious to people around you. You will attract events that that occur because it's obvious to people around you that ch- real change is occurring. It's occurring, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Well, maybe um, I can leave our viewers with some reflection questions. That'd be fantastic. Um, yeah. So, and again, these uh, these outlines are downloadable from our website. Mm-hmm. If anyone would like to actually have a look at the actual questions that I'm about to read out because there's a bit of length to them. (laughs) So one of the first themes that we talked about in this chapter was that God's universe is designed to bring about learning. So Fred notices this in relation to the spirit world and as children on earth we're often aware of this but lose this sense as adults. So some reflection questions are consider how you can become more aware of the lessons in the design of the natural universe around you. Consider how you can become more aware of the lessons through the events and people that you attract. Mm. And think about if you loved learning, how would your daily life look? Yeah, I think that's a very important question question. myself. Because uh, to me, it's like if we loved learning, you've got to ask yourself the question, if you really loved learning, would your day-to-day life be the same as it was yesterday or the day before or the day before? Wouldn't you have made some plans to attempt to learn something new today that you didn't learn yesterday and particularly learn something new at your soul level. So learn something new about yourself, about your soul, about its capacity, its Mm -hmm. capacity to grow and change. Wouldn't that be your primary focus? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, the second major theme we talked about was about condition limiting us and Mm. the, the law of love. So... Can you see this law in operation on your, in your life on the earth, so day to day? How much do you begrudge what you attract without pausing to consider what lesson in love you may be resisting that prevents an improvement in your life? Mm. I see that's something that a lot of people overlook. Mm. They're sort of saying, oh, I'm attracting all these angry women and they might say oh it's about my mother stuff but a lot of times there's a lot of lessons of love that I see that God is attempting to show us one is about forgiveness of mm. the women in our lives including which, our which mother. we're often refusing to do because we're so angry <laughs> yes and another area where I feel that people overlook is to overlook how they treat women mm. Yeah. And what that what impact that might be having in their and how attraction. angry they are with their mothers compared to you know it's like they call it their mother staff or whatever it is but yep. but it's almost like a justification it's all and, and in a lot of ways it's also all saying 
it's my mother caused this stuff, you know what I mean? Like, exactly. Uh, and sure, she might have caused this stuff by a treatment of you, but at the end of the day, it is in you. And now you're the one who's unloving. You're the one who's treating other people unlovingly. So, and it's your soul that's going to be stagnant while you hold on to this yeah. material, so, while you hold on to this unloving behaviour or unloving emotion. So surely you'd be saying more than just it's my mother stuff. Exactly, because just as your mother is responsible for the way she behaved towards you, mm. you are now responsible for how you behave towards yes. all women. Yes. And if we are acting out our suppressed rage at our mother at all other women, mm. that's, a, that's one mother and a lot of other women. And, and there's we... a lot of unloving behaviour engaged there. Yes. And that's all about condition, as you rightly yeah. point out. So the question is really about condition. If my condition was changing, would I continue to hold on to these, you know, belief systems that I have, that I have a right to be angry with my mother. Yeah. Well, you wouldn't. No. You, you, you'd see that you do, that you are angry with your mother. You'd understand why you're angry with your mother, but you wouldn't believe for the rest of your life that you now have a reason to just take it out on your mother for the rest of her, her, your existence and hers. Yeah. You'd go through the emotions needing to go through forgiveness yeah. instead. Yeah. Okay. Another theme was that true service is motivated by love. Mm. So some reflection questions. Recall a time when you felt someone had served you or given you a gift motivated purely by love. What did that feel like? Now, for some people, or for a lot of people, I think there might be some occasions in their life where they did feel that a gift came just from love. Mm. And it's, I feel it's really nice to feel about those things because it, it helps us to feel sometimes the contrast of the times when it wasn't done with mm. that intention, mm. but also where we're at in terms of giving in that way. And mm. that's the second question. Consider what motivates you to do things or give things to others. What errors and addictions still drive you? Yeah, and particularly it's these addictions, isn't it? The codependencies yeah. that we have that we need to reflect upon. You know, obviously this aspect is aspiring to become more loving in our day-to-day -day life. That will cause change to our soul. Yes. As we can see in Fred's case in the book, he's always aspiring to learn something new, but not just learn something new from a knowledge perspective. He's aspiring to become a more loving person through the interaction. Yeah. And this is, a, this is where we need to start to see how we really learn. Instead of, instead of being focused on learning new material, we need to focus on learning how to become a more loving individual. Yeah. And, and this is good, these are good questions to ask ourselves to help us analyse whether that's actually happening or not. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and the final sort of questions was about the true nature of our soul. Consider the quote, activity is the natural heritage of the soul, mm. excelsior its motto and holiness its goal. How does this view contrast, contrast with what you feel and how you live your life? Mm. And how are you avoiding action or procrastinating in your life? Mm. Which is the opposite of activity. Exactly. Yeah. 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 A lot of us love procrastinating, don't we? <laughs> we do. It's a way to live in fear, mm. actually. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that about wraps up our discussion of the first part of Chapter 21. Mm. Thank you so much, honey, for yeah, talking pleasure. with me about that today. Yeah, good subjects for everyone to think about this time, I think, yeah. isn't it? So hopefully you've enjoyed our discussion together and uh, it's been a fairly brief discussion in comparison to our normal ones, but there's a lot of food for thought in it. So we thought we'd break it into these two parts so you give you some time to actually feel about <laughs> what's being presented in such a short burst. Exactly. Yeah. So we'll see you next time for our final discussion of Through the Mists. Yeah. See you later then.